church, everybody. It's so good to have you this morning in the 9.45, 55-ish service. Um, good to have you in church this morning. I'm glad you came out and that we can have a great time together this morning. If you are new, obviously, with us, welcome to Sycamore Church. We are so glad to have you. And you have every right to feel right at home. You came on a good day. We are right in the middle and the second week of a series we called Attitudes. And um, in case you're like, why are you saying attitudes as attitudes? It's actually the attitudes of our heart. And we are exploring just how God can do something incredible in our hearts. Because we tried to establish last week that um, we are wired to believe. And God doesn't just wire us as people that want to believe. He gives us what to believe. And so last week we saw how we can just come to that place where we say we believe in Jesus. And as simple as that sounds, we try to see just how powerful it is and how life-defining it is. And, you know, we really can't say how important it is to get it right in our hearts. The heart is so crucial to everything that would ever be. The heart is the seed of our lives. Everything is flowing out of our lives. Medical science will tell you that your heart is pumping blood to the whole body. And it's that idea that everything coming out of my life, everything I'm becoming, is flowing out of what's happening in my heart. So when God deals with us, he starts with our hearts. God conversations are hearts deep. They go straight for the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God is always looking at the heart. So if God is going to get our lives right, he's going to get our lives right by getting our hearts right. In Luke chapter 6 verse 42, it says, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit. Nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. But every tree is going to produce out. If the tree is good, then it's going to leak out good fruit. If it's bad, it's going to bring out bad fruit. It's, we're going to be what we are on, on the inside. I know you're standing. We're going to sit in a moment. Um, but we're doing this series and asking God to do a work in our hearts. Um, we're asking God, I, I don't know about you, but there are things that you kind of know this is for me. This is not just like my neighbor. There are times you hear someone preaching, like, tell my neighbor. But this is like, I need this. I need God to work in my heart. Proverbs 23 verse 4 says, above everything else, above everything else, guard your heart for it is the source of your life's consequences. Everything about your life is flowing out of the state of your heart. So friends, our hearts determine our lives. Our hearts, and, and it's the same in the negative, that if the devil wants to corrupt our lives, he goes for our hearts. He goes for the state of our hearts, the attitudes of our hearts. We just start getting something wrong in our hearts and then we get it wrong in our life. When God wants to save us, we believe with our hearts unto salvation, right? We believe something in our hearts. It starts from our heart. And if we're going to get it wrong, corruption is also going to start. Nobody's going to shoot an arrow at an enemy and aim the hand and, you know, the, you, you aim the heart. You're, you're going for where it really matters. And so the devil wants us to get it wrong at heart. But God wants us to get it right at heart. And so this morning, I don't know about you, but I'm desperately believing God to do a life-defining work on my heart. And um, if that's you this morning, can we make a declaration together? Can we do that? All right, so we're going to put a declaration on the screen. I want you to say it out loud this morning. One, two, three, everybody go. Today, I give God liberty to work on my heart. Life-defining work in me today. He's making my heart strong, steadfast. And aligned with his purpose for me. Bring it on, God. I'm expectant and ready. Who says amen to that? I'll tell one or two people God's going to speak to you. And you can be seated this morning. Everybody online, you can quickly check the rice you are cooking and get back. Um, let's do this together. Have, have you ever seen something that when you saw it, it was actually more than what you saw? But what you saw in the immediate, you know, kind of almost got you confused. You were already jumping at an offer thinking it was all good until you saw the terms. You know those words, terms and conditions apply. Until you saw the terms and conditions, you were driving home one day and you just saw sack your landlord with 10,000 naira. You are like, oh, well, I'm going to become a landlord, thank you. Until you got there and you saw that the 10K was actually the application form to start, you know, applying for, you know, all that kind of thing, right? So it, on the outside, it just kind of looks it. But when you see what was really inside, it was a lot more than that. Maybe that's the story of your marriage. Like, before you got married, you know. <laughs> anyway, so, so the point is that sometimes what you see on the outside um, just gives you that picture until you kind of get um, close enough. On the 14th of April, 1912, um, a guy called Frederick Fleet, he was, he's a British sailor and a crewman. He was on lock, lookout duties for the Titanic. And you know about what happened with the Titanic. But this guy, Frederick Fleet, spotted an iceberg and he made an announcement about it. Now, later on, he was one of the survivors, and later on, when they were doing all the inquiries, he did say that, well, they didn't have binoculars. They didn't see it on time, and so they didn't make the announcement on time. But if they had binoculars and they saw it early enough, um, perhaps the disaster would have been averted. But you know about the Titanic and how it was this massive $7.5 million 
of that time, which is estimated at about $183 million now, massive construction, um, and it took them, you know, just four days into the maiden voyage of that Titanic, and it hit that iceberg with 2,240 passengers on board and went down. Um, but the iceberg that the Titanic collided with, which this guy drew their attention to, um, was just approximately 50 to 100 feet high and about 200 to 400 feet long. And so it was really large enough to cause the disaster, not because of what you saw on the outside, but because 90% of the iceberg was beneath the water. And so what we were seeing on the outside was just the tip, like they say, the tip of the iceberg. What we were seeing on the iceberg was just the tip. But the real thing that you know, caused that disaster uh, was the 90% that was not seen. And so Fleet was um, pretty much a sad guy. He was a survivor from the accident, but later in life he suffered from depression. And they say possibly partly due to the disaster and all that he saw. And so in January 1965, he committed suicide and killed himself. Now, what we clearly see um, without binoculars this time is that real power, real power is to be big on the inside. Real power is to be big on the inside. And we can't be deceived by what's happening on the outside. It's not just about, you know, all the activity and all that we see on the outside. Real power is to be big on the inside. Real power is to be big on the inside. But the truth is, if we're honest, friends, life kind of, just the day and age in which we live, throws us in almost like the opposite direction of that. And so we try to be big on the outside, and many times at the expense of the inside, at the cost of what's happening within us. So there's all the effort to be big, but it's in the things that are seen, it's in the things that everybody sees. The big tendency in our social media age is to be bigger and bigger with the things people see, and we become smaller and smaller with the things that people don't even see. That's the social media age in which we live. And so you work so hard to just get it right on the outside. There's a life you want to have. There's a way you want to look. There's a way you want to appear to people. There's how you want people to think about you. You know, you're not as concerned about being successful as much as you want people to think you are successful. You're not as concerned about having stuff as much as how people will feel when they notice you have it. So you're more concerned about the publicity for what you have than the fact that you actually have it. That's the life we live in, right? You work so hard to get the right smile for the gram. And, um, you know, it's amazing that couples will literally fight to have a happy picture. Literally. Like, we'll fight. Like, no, stand there. No, you can't do that. Of course you can't. No, you can't. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's just write. And then we have a good-looking photo shoot at the expense of our happiness. That's the life we live. Big on the outside and many times at the cost of what's happening on the inside. And so the, the social media life, we are so busy just about what goes out, capturing a life that we have never experienced. You know, your, your, your camera phone is, is always, um, you know, ready, right? Capturing a life that you haven't even experienced. Sometimes you haven't even met the person, like a relationship that a moment with somebody you have to experience, but oh my God, oh my God, I get you. Can we just have a picture? You are capturing something you have not even experienced. But we're big on the outside um, and many times at the cost of the inside. And so we end up being, if we are honest, big in memory, um, big headed, but small hearted. Big, there's a lot that we can talk about. There's a lot of pictures we have. You have plenty of group pictures, but you don't have friends. You know, you are <laughs> photobombing all over the place, but no connections. You get what, you get what I'm trying to say? That's where the world pushes us towards, that we can have so much. But, but here's the thing with God. With God, he wants to work it in us so that he can work it out of us. Anything God wants to do will start from a conversation he's bringing into you so that he can bring it out of you. So God would say, I'm working it in you. He would say, I'm working in you, your salvation, so that you can work it out. He would say, I'm working in you a type of person. I'm working in you a journey so that you can work it out, okay? So for a topic this morning, what I want to ask is, is your heart large enough for your dream life? Is your heart large enough for your dream life? Help me politely look at somebody around you. Yeah, the excited people come for second service. You know those first service, you're very sad people, very annoying. You, know, you don't even want to know how it goes there. Anyway, I, I mean, this morning, I even just walked out on it. Anyway, but, but, but is your heart large enough? Help me look at somebody next to you this morning and ask the person, um, is your heart large enough for your dream life? Friends, see, largeness of heart will attract a truly large life. A small heart cannot carry the wonder and the beauty of the life that God wants for you. 
I promise you, we can't be small-hearted and live the life that God intends for us. If we are small-hearted, this is the truth, we will live small because the true picture of our lives is the picture of our heart. At the end of the day, our lives are going to look like our heart. A good tree will produce good fruit. A bad tree will produce bad. It's about what we are on the inside that we will produce on the outside. So at the end of the day, if we are small-hearted, we will live small. Let me tell you what it's like to be small on the inside. At the end of the day, the outside of your life will look like the capacity within you. Here's what I'm saying. If you have a capacity of 10, right? Let's just put a number to it. Your capacity is 10. And I give you 10,000 on the outside. Do you know what you do? Just give it time. That 10,000, you will shrink it to the 10 that you are. On the flip side, if in capacity you are a thousand and I give you 10, that 10, just give it time, you will grow it to the thousand that you are. That's how capacity works. That who we are on the inside is what we make of our experiences, is what we make of the things that are in our hands. So at the end of the day, it's not about just pursuing all of these things on the outside to be large on the outside. I want a large life and I'm pursuing it on there. It's about becoming something within because if we are large within, then we would have a large life. But if I'm small within, it doesn't matter the opportunities you give me. It doesn't matter the access you give me. It doesn't matter what's going on in my life. If I'm small within, it doesn't matter the conversations I come to. You will eventually live petty and small when you are small on the inside. Listen to Genesis chapter 28. A guy called Jacob is having a moment with God. And so Jacob is traveling from home. He's running away from his brother. And you know everything that's happened. He has just cheated his brother. But he's in this reactive space. It's just this thing of man. I'm trying to get away. I'm trying to have a life. What's going to happen? I've cheated my brother. How will I feed? He's just in that space of life. Now Jacob sleeps and he's having a dream and then he basically has an encounter with God. Now in verse 13, the Bible says that behold, the Lord stood above it, that's this ladder, and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you. Now I I want you to picture the emotion. Jacob was not looking for God. He basically just went to bed one night and God showed up. This is as big as it gets. This is God coming through beyond your wildest imaginations and God just coming and just listen to the voice of promise. Listen to the possibilities that God is opening up to just an innocent young man doing his stuff and God shows up and this is a big conversation. Listen, God says the land on which you lie, I will give to you and I will give to your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. Did you hear that? You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Wow. God just comes to you and he's making all this promise. And he says, behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you. (laughs) See promise until I have done what I have spoken to you. So Jacob woke up in verse 16, and Jacob said, what? Surely God, like, of course God is in this place. Like, I wasn't even looking for him. I just went to bed, and God has visited me. Do you hear the promise of my descendants, of being like the sand of the seashore? Do you hear the promise of God being with me wherever I go, of generations? He's talking about my father's father. He's talking about my father. He's confirming covenant and promise with me and all of that. And so Jacob said, God is in this place, and I didn't even know it. And Jacob was afraid, and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Good stuff, Jacob. That Jacob rose in the morning, verse 18, and he took the stone, and he began to worship and poured oil on top of it and all of that. Now let's go to verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, like this is now Jacob's response. Now let's hear him. He now said, "Hmm, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I'm going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on uh-uh. so that I come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. Have you ever been speaking to somebody and like, did you hear what I said? Did you hear what God was telling you, Jacob? God is telling you about your descendants. He's talking about covenant. He's talking about, you say, God will give me bread and clothing. Then the Lord would have shown himself as my God. Listen, at the end of the day, it didn't matter how big a promise God was bringing. Because this guy was small-hearted, he was reducing it to the size of where his heart was. All that this guy is thinking is, how will I survive? How will I make it through to tomorrow? And so God is coming with promise of generations and saying, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This guy is saying, ah, let me have bread and you shall be my God. You have shown yourself faithful in my life. Then God is saying, do you hear the compromise I'm calling you to? And what I'm saying, friends, is eventually our lives will look like our hearts. That if we're having a God conversation at the level of our smallness and our pettiness, we will reduce a sense of destiny to pettiness. That's what I'm trying to say to us today. And so, um, if you're large on the inside, even in the toughest times, 
Even when what's around you doesn't align with the largeness of your heart, the truth is you will live a large life because eventually your life will look like your heart. Amen, anybody? In Matthew chapter 25, verse 15, you know the story about the talents and how that the master was given to them, all right? He was allocating to them. But I think the wordings are instructive because um, if God wants to establish it in your life, he would first of all establish it in your heart so that he can bring into your life based on what you have capacity for. So the wordings in Matthew 25, why did he give one five? Why does one guy have two? Why does another guy have one? Listen to the words in verse 15. He gave them each according to his own ability. Each according to his own ability. I like how ERV puts it. ERV says, he decided how much each servant will be able to care for. What can each person be trusted with? And it's based on that I give you. So, why is your life having this much? It's capacity. It's a largeness within. Amen, anybody? Okay, so, before God puts something in your hands, he first of all looks for space for it in your heart. Before God will put it in your hands, he will look for space for it in your heart. And so, I don't know about you, but I don't just want to be winning on the outside, you know, pursuing all the big opportunities, acquiring, getting big, and not having a heart that can carry it. I don't want to have that kind of life. For everything I'm pursuing on the outside, I want to be sure that within I have the capacity and the heart that can carry it. I don't know if you've, you probably have heard about the Great Wall of China. The Great Wall of China, um, till today, is regarded as, I mean, it was voted as one of the seven wonders of the Asian world, which is an incredible feat. But today, it is regarded as the largest man-made project in the world. The largest man-made project in the world. The Great Wall of China was a series of fortifications. It was a culmination of walls that were over 20,000 kilometers. Think about that. That is massive, over 20,000 kilometers. And it took them, wait for it, over 2,000 years to construct. Think about the number of generations, blah, blah, blah. It was massive. It took 2,000 years to construct this Great Wall of China. So it was huge, and it was built, you know, 20,000 kilometers and all of that. Why did they build it? Primarily, they built it because China was suffering invasions primarily from the Mongolians. They were invading China and all of that. And so these guys come together and say, let's fortify something. Let's build something. And so they put in effort over 2,000 years. Effort, skill, you know, resource and all of that because the Mongolians are invading. And so we want to defend ourselves. And so they do all of this. But guess what? According to history, and this was about 14th century there about. According to history, China was still invaded by the Mongolians after the war. In the first hundred years of the war being constructed, China was still invaded by the Mongolians. Some people say at least, some people say twice, but some say it was once, but at least once, okay, possibly twice. China was still invaded by the same Mongolians after getting the biggest construction known to man till date. You are still invaded. Why? How? You know what? Twice they bribed the gatesmen and came in. What? Like we're putting effort to be big on the outside and not just taking care of the heart. That what is guarding the gate of my life? What is guarding? But I just want all this bigness. And I'm telling you, China, literally after constructing for 2,000 years, you are still invaded twice by bribing a gate man. My question this morning is, how can I make my heart large enough to accommodate the dream life that God wants to bring me into? Because it's not just about, man, I want more, God, I want more. And we're just whining and moaning and, God, I want more and all of that. I'm asking today, are we hearted for more? It's not enough to just desire and to cry and to pray and all of that. I'm asking today, are we hearted for more? Am I large-hearted enough for more and better opportunities and, you know, just more with relationships and more in the space of life and all of that that God calls me to? Am I hearted for more influence, for more success, for, for more and all of that? In 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29, the Bible says about Solomon, God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Man, God gave, this is such a blessing. God gave Solomon wisdom and exceeding great understanding. And look at that. God gave him largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. There's something that God can put doing us that is called largeness of heart. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the East and all the wisdom of Egypt. Somebody say this morning, say, God, give me largeness of heart. And honestly, you want this. This is what you want to be desiring and praying and saying, God, give me largeness of heart. This is what you want to be pursuing. You don't just want to be pursuing largeness on the outside and impressing a world and all of that. You want to be pursuing largeness within. You want to be learning for it. You want to be exposing yourself in the right ways. You want to be studying. You want to be praying. You want to be engaging conversations. Let something be invested within me. Let the progress I'm looking for in life not just be about external things. Let me be looking for progress inside. There's a journey I want to be traveling on my 
my inside so that I can rightly travel the journey on my outside. There is a becoming I need on my inside so there can be the right becoming on my outside. You want to be saying, God, give me largeness of heart. Give me something within that can carry what is outside. Give me, make me more within, not just about the desires and everything on the outside. And, and that's great, and we'll get to that in a moment, but something within me needs to be able to carry because I can build the great world of China and still be invaded if I don't take care of the heart. Amen, anybody? And so you want to be taking advantage and learning and growing. And you also want to be converting. Listen, not everything in life is going to come to you just in the, in the, in the, in, in the idea of, oh, what a blessing. Some things are going to come and all you can say is what a lesson. But if you are learning the right lessons, friends, we can be converting value. Listen to James chapter 1 verse 2. It says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various... How many of you can say in the last one month, three months, I've been in some trials? Anybody? Let me just check it out. All right. So, so, so at least most of us, um, 60%, let me see, the rest, maybe 40% liars. Let's just see. All right. All right. We, 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 we go through trials. Okay, stuff happens. Like life happens. Like somebody just tries your patience, all right? Maybe you are just speeding down that body, that road. You got to that traffic light as it was about to turn um, red. And it turned red. And he's starting from 90, and you just, oh my God, you you know, it's a trial, all right, right? Different kinds of trials. And then you now see that micro driver passing, and you just just also go, you know, some form of trial, right? It can be that kind of trial, or it can be maybe something really happening in your life. Maybe a tough situation this morning. Maybe something you're really going through, all right? Trials, okay? Just the idea that everything is not what I want it to be. But here's the deal. When everything is not what I want it to be, I have a choice to make. And it's the choice of how I count it. That's, That's what he said. How do you count it? How do you count trials? So if I count it all joy, all right? So my choice there is not whether or not I'll have trials. That's not on your table. What is on your table is how do you count trials? So if I count trials as joy, why would I do that? Because verse 3, it says, knowing, there's something you know, that the testing of your faith will produce something. There is a process going on here, all right? So I know that the testing of my faith is producing patience. And I know in verse 4 that patience, when it is, has its perfect work, it will make me perfect and complete like a nothing. So I know that what is starting from a trial has convertible value to make me something, all right? Has convertible value to be establishing me as a kind of person, if only I count it all joy. Not if I count it with mourning and with whining and with complaining, but when I start to count it joy and think God is at work in me right here, right now. An organization might feel they're stressing me, but I count it that God is stretching me. So I count it all joy. Somebody might let me alone, but I count it that God is preparing me. So I count it all joy. I count it all joy because I see a working of God in this that is working patience. So you know what I'm doing? It might not be a direct blessing, but I can make it a life-changing lesson. That's what I'm doing. All right? So I count it all joy. And when we are this kind of people that are saying, man, whatever it is, in the things that look good, in the things that look difficult, I am trying to convert it to capacity for my heart, for a kind of person that I'm becoming. So I want to be bigger and stronger at heart. Let me try and show you today, before I close, what I think a large heart can look like in our day and age, just in the times in which we live. What, what would a large heart look like for us? All right? I think that just in the world that we live, there are some things that we have to be larger than. That's what I want to show you today. I'll try and do four things that we have to be larger than. First of all, we have to be larger than the realities of offense. We have to be larger than the realities of offense. All right. How many of you have ever told a lie in your life? Let me see. You've lied before. Don't tell one again now. Let me just see. (laughs) You've lied before. All right. Let me tell you somebody that's never lied. Right? Jesus. You thought I was saying myself. (laughs) Jesus. All right? Now, let me show you what Jesus says in Luke chapter 17. Jesus that cannot lie, that never lied. Jesus said in Luke 17 verse 1, Jesus said, it is not possible that no offense will come. Offense will come. Friends, you'll be offended. People will do you shaggy. Somebody will do something that they should not do. A system, a person, a parent, a child, a relative, a boss, an employer, you know, will offend a friend will offend, right? Jesus says it's not possible that, you will not, that offense will not come, right? Now, whether or not you will now live offended is another question. But Jesus said offenses will come. And Jesus didn't lie. Just live long enough. Just go out enough. Nobody will offend you. So, there's a difference between offenses coming and you living offended. The point you want your heart to get to is where your heart is larger than offense. That offense will come, but I'm larger. Because see, friends, you can't do that. 
You can't live that offended life. You can't be offended and live in the rhythms of the life God is calling you. That's what I'm trying to say. That if you don't win it in your heart, you can't be that beautiful person, that large life that God calls you to. You can't live in the realities of offense and live in the beautiful picture of the life God calls you to. There are people sometimes you're offended at your spouse. Um, because the truth is, the people closest to you at some point will hurt you. Amen. You're offended at friend, spouse, systems. Maybe you're even offended at the country. You're offended at the country. You are in an abusive relationship. So you are, every day you wake up, you are, you are, before it's 6 a.m., you have hissed 12 times. 12 before 6 a.m. <laughs> but listen, if we are large enough, and how will we be large enough? Maybe you're like, man, offense is real. Yes. So we have to be large enough by the power of love and forgiveness. Then we can truly live. We're going to be large by the power of love. Our love and forgiveness must be larger than the realities of offense. And maybe you, you, you're like, I, I offended. Mm, yes, please tell my neighbor. I know a friend that is really offended. And you just feel like offended, me, kid, that is far away, like offended and all of that. But let's be honest. Sometimes, you know, it's not, uh, maybe offended is a big word. But you know, just that subtle, eh, that cold war. Eh? We're not saying anything, but our silence is communication. You know? You know when you just start to live a life and you're building and making decisions and, you know, living your life and all of that, friend, what I'm trying to say to you is that if you are, if your heart is governed by what people did to you, all right, and not what Jesus has done for you, then that person has control over your life. The moment I'm making decisions and choices and left or right and blah, 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 and it's, ah, uh, I'm seeing that face. And the reason why you even you know, posted that picture. You are just checking to see if this person has checked your status. You know, you know just that, and all of that, right? That person has control. And you can't do that to yourself, friend. Um, you can't start to de- make future decisions and determine all of that just based on others. Um, there's this old story of the serpent that was slithering into a dark room and then it just gets to a point where something sharp feels like it cuts it and then uh, the serpent is like, uh, I felt like, and then it's seen its blood and he realizes that it hit the edge of a knife, a sharp knife and wow, now the serpent is bleeding and the serpent is so angry and why would the knife do that? Why would it be there and all of that? And so he goes to the knife and it throws its body and it's trying to like harm the knife and so he hits the knife once and hits the knife again and it's hitting the knife again, hitting and hitting and hitting till he drops dead. It's just a picture of how we start to live our lives like we're angry at them and what they did and why would you and all of that. And at the end of the day, friends, if we'll be honest, the thing with offense is that we are the losers. We are the losers. Your heart was made to love God, not to hold grudges against people. We are the losers. And it might be justifiable. Why did my father do that? Why did that person do that? There are big questions. But what I'm saying is we cannot afford offense. I was telling you last year when we did this Heart Still series and I was preaching on the power of a clean heart and I said the truth about a clean heart is not that it is always clean but that it's always cleaned. There must be the active measure to say I'm flushing this thing, I'm, I'm getting rid of it, I need to be dealing with it because I can't become the kind of person living offended. Jesus commanded and Jesus said you must forgive. Jesus said you must forgive. In Matthew chapter 18 verse 21, Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? Good question. And if I forgive and, and I forgive him up to seven times, can we do seven? And Jesus said, I do not say to you seven, but I say 70 times seven. And Jesus was not saying keep count. Jesus was saying lose count. That's what Jesus is saying. He's not saying keep count until you have completed 70 times seven. He's saying lose count. Let it be so abundant that you, you can't even keep count on because you're just in this constant journey of, man, as long as it depends on me, I will forgive. And how will we do that? Because you hear some of the things Jesus says, and you better hear Jesus well. If not, you just go and Jump in the way. Listen to, to, to what um, Jesus said. <laughs> well, how will I do that? How will I forgive? So Jesus goes on to tell a story of how we can do it. In verse 23 of the same chapter, Jesus then goes on to tell a story of a guy that owed 10,000 denarii and was forgiven by his master. And then the guy now, as he go, walks away, sees another servant that owed him 100 so you are owing 10,000, they forgave you. you now, somebody now owed you 100, and the guy presses P, he changes it for this guy, he's holding him and saying, I'll lock him. They just forgive you 10,000. You can't forgive 100. And Jesus is putting that as the context of why we should forgive. In other words, when we make a decision to forgive, we're not looking at the offender. We're looking at the one we had offended. The reason why we will forgive is because we are the bigger offenders as far as God is concerned. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So Jesus is saying, always put what people do against you in the context of what you had done against God. 
And if God forgave you, then you have to forgive. Amen. And so no matter what was done to you, we owe him the bigger debt. And so there, there are practical decisions sometimes, all right? I'm not, Jesus said offenses will come. Jesus didn't say go and look for offense. So um, sometimes you need to create protection. Um, somebody say, if I forgive, does that mean I forget? There are two separate conversations, right? Sometimes the forgetfulness is not even linked to the offense, all of that, right? Um, so... Sometimes there are practical decisions you need to make. But what I'm saying here is the deal of have I forgiven or not. This is the deal. So whatever, so hear me well, guard yourself. Don't make yourself a victim in the world. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? But now, it also used to say that Jesus said they slap you on one side, turn the other side. But he didn't say what you should do after they slap the second side. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So don't unnecessarily make yourself a victim, okay? <laughs> but here's the deal. When I'm dealing with somebody, and the reference point of my dealing is what they have done to me, not what Jesus has done for me, then there's offense. There's offense. So whatever practical decisions I need to make, the point is, do I see you through the lens of Jesus? Do I see you through the lens of who Jesus is to me? Or is it just the weight? That person is having control over your life. And the truth, friends, is that when our hearts get caged in that point of offense, then we are tying ourselves, we're becoming small-hearted. Um, we're becoming petty, we're becoming small. One human being, one system is now having world power over your life. It's too small a way to live. And so we would only have a large life and enjoy the beauty even of relationships and just the beauty of the life God calls us to when we can thrive in forgiveness. Second thing I want to encourage us this morning um, is that we need to be larger than the distraction from opposition. There is real distraction in our world, and especially even just from the fact that we, we are opposed. You probably know about Nehemiah. I was talking about the Chinese wall, but you remember a guy in the Bible, Nehemiah, who built the wall. And, um, you know, the, the story of him building and completing a wall was a story of finishing through the lens of, you know, the, the reality of distraction, of opposition. We're seeing Sambalat and Tobiah. We're seeing them making news headlines about him. We're seeing mocking. We're seeing laughing. We're seeing, you know, distractions and all of that. And we're seeing somebody who is staying true to vision, even as he's dealing with opposition. And so Nehemiah is saying, you know what? We'll keep in one hand battling equipment, but we'll keep building equipment. So there's the reality of what opposition comes at us and how we have to deal with that. But there's a sense of we must be a people that have what it takes to be loud larger than the opposition, to not bring our lives to the level of opposition, to not bring our lives to the smallness of opposition, but that we can live for the greatness of vision. And so at some point, friends, the vision that is calling us must be greater than the strength of the, the opposition that we face, the contentions that we face, that sense of what's the vision that is calling us? What's the vision that we're living, uh, um, living for? You know, as a young chap, one of my dreams was to play soccer um, professionally. And um, you know, I, I remember that, um, let that sink in for a minute. Um, so, yes, I was going to, but um, prayer that was never answered. Um, but I was actually going to, and I know your mind, you are saying, how can you? I could. <laughs> anyway, but, but I remember that, that you, know, you, have, you know how you have dream moments of when you score one goal, and one of my prayer points then was always that, you know, God, I promise that on the day I make my debut for Liverpool, that when I score, I'll remove my shirt and I'll write Jesus the Lord, that God, I promise it will be a means of evangelism. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it never worked out. So, but, but you know how you dream moments and you even practice it at home and all of that? There's this moment in a soccer game that you never want to be as a player. I don't know, but there was that moment of penalty shootouts, if you know anything about soccer, when teams are playing, and in a critical game, like World Cup final, all of that, like champion level, critical game. Every footballer is going to have that, you know, that tension of walking from the halfway line where all your teammates are. And you're going to walk up to that penalty spot. And you're going to walk alone. And 60,000 or whatever eyes in this stadium are on you. And people are screaming and shouting. And you're going to pick up that ball. And you're going to put it on the penalty spot and take two steps back or whatever you take. And the referee's going to play a whistle. And you all alone, you're going to have to face. And, and friends, it's worse when you are walking from the halfway line and the people that you are facing are the opposing fans. And you know how they'll be screaming and making faces and doing everything and shouting and whatever and all of that. And you know what you're trying to do as a footballer? You see this 19-year-old who is trying to keep a focus and his face is straight and he's He's just trying to keep his focus on what he's planning to do and he's thinking about where he's going to kick that ball and man I don't dream of being in those moments because I'm like if I'm the one I just feel at some point my feet will just start shaking I will just start crying my mommy I don't know I don't know but it's just a picture of the power of focus 
what I want to get done. It's worse when it's the opposing goalkeeper that comes to give you the ball. You know those goalkeepers that will now come and we don't want to give you the ball. <laughs> you know, it's worse. Bullies, right? But imagine today Arsenal is playing Man City and then Haaland has a penalty to take and he puts the ball down and he steps back and he's about to take it. One Arsenal fan from the crowd just shouts that, Alan, you are too tall. And he now says, how can somebody say that? He has already missed it. Do you know what I'm trying to say? The, at some point in your life, the moment opposition has your ears, you have already lost. At some point in your life, the moment you're even already lifting and responding and saying, but why did they say, but what do people think? You have already lost it. There's distraction and it's real, friends. And so now after two hours, Haaland convinces that guy that I'm not too tall, my height is good. And the guy says, okay. <laughs> is that a win? At some point, getting a louder voice than opposition is not even your conversation. They say, Haaland, during the summer, you added weight. And I say, you can't be fat. So you're crying every night because somebody called you fat. <laughs> One of my guys who is a pastor, he started dating a girl then, and he said to me, he said that, you know, um, that the thing he loves about the girl is that she's fat. And so I was like, uh, 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 pastor. He now said, no, what I mean by that is faithful, available, teachable. Oh, I said, okay. <laughs> and the pastor that will be using... Uh, Listen, friends, largeness is having a heart that can be focused on a sense of vision. We need it. This world will make you small. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 21, listen. Do not take, heart every, do not take to heart everything people say. If not, you will hear your servant cursing you. If the thing you are looking for, you will hear it. The way you have read every news headline, you have Googled your name, you will see what you are looking for. Take heart everything people say. Your own servant, you hear them cutting. My office is separate from all staff. <laughs> Third this morning. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that there. <laughs> Third, thirdly this morning. We need a heart that is larger. Is this helping anybody today? Yes. We need a heart that is larger than the pressure of temporary things. Larger than the pressure of temporary things. Friends, we live in a very unstable world. Ephesians chapter 4 says that we should not be like children tossed to and fro by every wind. The wind's blowing, tossing, temporary things, time-bound things. But we must be large enough to hold what I call permanent truth in temporary situations. It's largeness. Where you can, yes, I'm dealing with temporary things, but you cannot allow your identity to fluctuate with news headline. You can't allow it. What you think about yourself, your confidence about your life is just going with the news. What did President Sinubu say? What did he not say? What did they, say? What did they not say? What did they do? Who are the new ministers? Who are not? Who are... You can't build your life on temporary things. Ministers will come and go. Governments will come and go. Are you hearing me? You can't allow your joy to be going with your bank account. Just connect it. So... <laughs> because oh, those are temporary things. But what God invites, listen to what James says about life as a whole. James says in chapter 4, you know James is this guy, I'll just tell you the way it is. All this packaging that Paul will give for you. James is just telling you. James says that, what is your life? It is a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. This is your whole life. It's phew. Your whole life, everything you pursue, everything you get, you get vapor. So why will you sacrifice eternal promises for time-bound pressure? Pressure that is time-bound, that they're already doing countdown, 10, 9, 8. Then you're not going to make one big decision about your life and, you know, why will you sacrifice eternal promises? John Bevere will say we need to be driven by eternity. The driving force in your life must be something more than just temporary things that come and go. And listen, friends, see, honestly, the reality of when I'm saying temporary pressures and all of that, sometimes it is real pain, it is real loss. Mm? Life is life. Don't get me wrong, I'm not undermining. And sometimes we suffer real pain in this world. Mm? Jesus said in this world, you have tribulations. That's what Jesus said. Right? Except you say Jesus is lying. You have. Not everything will go the way you want it to go. Sometimes it's pain, sometimes it's loss. But what I'm saying is that if we're large within, all those things that happen will meet us where we are. So let me tell you what I'm saying. Have you ever lost a thousand naira before? 
Losing a thousand naira is different from losing a thousand naira, depending on where you are. Eh, where he met you. So there are days you lost one kid. You're like, ah, it's like there's one one kid on the table. Eh, I didn't even notice. Because uh, life is boiling, you know. You know, you know, you know. But there are days. <laughs> that one K. That one K. You would think it's the lost ship in the Bible. The way it will go after it. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? There are days like that. Is it about one K being more than one K? It's about who you are, where you are. And what I'm saying is that where your heart is large, pain comes, but your heart can accommodate it in the reality of bigger truths. Loss comes, but I can, I'm not, I'm not undermining what they did. I'm not undermining what I lost. I'm not undermining the pain of a system and all. But I'm saying if we have large hearts, we can take more. That's the way the world works. Hmm. I'm even saying one kid. There are days you look for 100 naira. <laughs> ah, let's not talk about it. <laughs> you need to be larger at heart than your account balance. Temporary situations that you are broke, so the whole world should stop. Don't be small. Temporary, that's what I'm saying. It's a temporary thing. Okay, you have been broke before, have you not? Is this the first time of being broke? Is this your first time of being broke? Have been broke before now? And the other times that you have been bowling. So, if you are broke now, it's a temporary situation. You don't now build so every sense of what God is trying. You even came to church, you even received from God, you are just angry at everybody, you are doing attitude, say, sit down, yeah, why? You know, just, it's broke now. It's been broke. Uh-uh. They say, let's sing. You, you, you do strong faith because I'm broke. Do they pay money to, to sing? So, could you? so, you lose the reality of the rhythms of life. Because you are not large enough to handle temporary things. That's what I'm saying. There has to be something in us that is larger. Here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. We have to be larger than it. Now, I'm not saying, you know, when it's bad, then you should be able to do life. I'm saying even when it's good, that should not be the basis of doing life. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So because you don't have um, likes on your, on your last Instagram post, you are sad. But what I'm saying is, when you have likes, does that mean you have arrived? Is that, this, is that is, it, is it the sense of affirmation? No, it's not. You should be bigger than whether there's like or no like. I'm standing for truth. Because the moment is about like, you will post anything so that they will like. And they now like it and say, well, I feel like eating, you need to say, well, thanks. <laughs> Anima. You are saying thanks. The things you must be larger than. Just larger at heart. Eh? Uh, did you first hold my time? <laughs> Don't look back, everybody. Look forward. <laughs> okay, so please come on the keyboard. Let's close this. So you should be larger than, than what's happening and than temporary things, temporary trends. Um, whether you're sad, whether you're down, whether. Um, don't get your affirmation from temporary things. Must be larger, 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 larger. Thank you, larger, larger, larger than the number of followers you have. Hmm? Because you, you, I, I was hoping that by the end of the year I have 1,000 followers on TikTok. Number one, why are you on TikTok? But number two, why? What does you do on TikTok? Larger, larger, larger than what is, than what is not. Okay, larger than what is happening. Larger, larger. We must be larger. Um, we must finally this morning. We must be larger than the tendencies of success. I really want to say this. We must be larger than the tendencies of success. The tendencies of success, I want to challenge us today because success comes with tendencies. When you suddenly start to succeed, when, you know, when you're broke, you can praise the Lord, you can seek the Lord. But when you are no longer hungry, you know, when you are no longer, um, when, when you are in an organization, you are always praying and, you know, God should touch the heart of your boss. Now you are the boss, you know. It comes with tendencies. And I want to say that we must be larger than the tendencies of success. T.D. Jakes preached the message many years ago, can you stand to be blessed? And it's that idea that everybody says I want to be blessed, but can you actually stand the blessing? That's a message I heard recently, um, Jeremiah Murray's preached, but somebody else is the topic. Uh, can you survive the anointing? <laughs> can you survive the anointing? Like, oh God, I want it. Can, can you stand to be blessed? Can you survive the anointing? All the things we want, because they come with tendencies. That's what I'm trying to say. They come with tendencies, oh. That many years ago, I remember many years ago, 2006 and all of that, I finished preaching a meeting and I was preaching for like, um, I was given maybe four hours or something. They told me to, pr- to preach for like two hours and then for like two hours to pray with people and, you know, just 
just whatever you want to do, you know, things that we said to any fair. <laughs> whatever you feel like doing as you just flew and all of that. So pretty preaching for like two hours. And I remember throughout the two hours, there was um, this lady who was sitting on a wheelchair. And as I was preaching, I was looking at her. And, you know, I was just, uh, as God will have it, that period of my life, I had just been listening to some things, you know. And some people had, you know, I just heard of the first time this guy went to a miracle, the first time. It was fresh. So as I was preaching, I knew where I was going. Like, let's just get done with this. And, let, and so I remember after the first, like, preaching, maybe it was two hours or something, and then I just said, everybody start praying, and there was just this atmosphere and all of that, and I remember just walking over to the, to the lady, she was there, following, and you know, like when Paul would say, we, we could see that this one had faith to be here, I felt like I could see, and all of that, and I remember just walking over, and I just held her hands, and I, it was a three-step thing, I played it in my mind, it was three steps, it's number one, you just go there, you hold the hand, do you want to walk, and she says, yes, you just pull up, it was three steps, all right? and so as I got there, do you want to walk, she says, no. Why? <laughs> I know it deflated something. I felt like I was ready for something that, when I think back now, when I think back now, I'm grateful to God. Right? There's the whole conversation, all of that. But I'm grateful to God that at that stage of my life, I didn't work that kind of miracle. I didn't have the heart for it. I don't want to succeed at a level that my capacity cannot carry. Do you get what I'm trying to say? What God was doing in my life in that season, I'm happy that he was digging deeper. So that what you see growing on the outside is because it has foundations. Not just one information that, do you understand what I'm trying to say? I'm grateful to God with all my heart. There are success comes. Some of you, you want the, 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 are you ready for fame? There's a guy some years ago that I was talking to and he wanted to be this music star. I, wanted to, I said, if a girl looks at you tonight and says she wants to sleep with you, can you stand it? He said, um, well, you know, are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> are you ready? So I'll get around you now, you're doing left right. You say you want to be famous. You want to be, you want to be a celeb. <laughs> can you handle success? Small money, you can't keep your head. But you want to blow. Blow what? <laughs> Let me ask you, can you succeed without being foolish? Can you? No, no, in a humble, sincere way. With love. <laughs> can you succeed without being foolish the other day in church we were asking that if you get 100 M what will you do it was good to see how people were eh? <laughs> you <know? laughs> can you you know are you, are you ready and here's what I'm saying when we come to a point where we are larger larger than the tendencies of success then we can really succeed but when you're at a point where we're trying to bring big do you know what Jacob was saying? God is like men to the left, to the right, the north, yourself, your descendants, your children's children, all the families in the earth will be blessed. But do you know what he's doing? He's turning it to, uh, if you give me clothes, if you give me food, it's materialistic. Huh? Can you succeed without becoming materialistic? Let me tell you the problem with being materialistic. is that it starts to govern you. It's not that you can't have stuff. But Jacob will now be the blessed. Those kind of people are dangerous when they succeed. Because that, that kind of guy becomes blessed. Because of that materialistic spirit. They now say, you all the families of the earth will bless. He will start charging families for the blessing. Because it's about what I can get. Do you, do you get what I'm trying to say? For your blessing, 10 naira. 10 naira per family of the earth. More, we have made it. What was to be a promise will become merchandise. And I'm asking you, friends, just, do you have a heart that is larger than the tendencies of success? Or can you handle influence without it getting into your head? Here's, here's how I always want to think. I want to be able to look in the mirror every day of my life and see the same person that I saw 20 years ago when I met Jesus. I want to see that same guy humble before the Lord. God, this is me. You see it all. You see my heart. There are things that come as a reason of where you are, blah, blah, blah. But between me and God, let's see the same person. Let what is around you not become how you become before God. So that's why you worship like a child. <laughs> because it's that same person that Jesus found. Do you get what I'm trying to say? You take yourself back to, he said to Saul, he said, when you are literally in your own eyes, God called you. But now you have become something else in your own eyes. And we have to have that going back. I'm grateful for every success. I'm grateful for everything God brings into your life. I'm grateful for the more. I'm grateful for influence. But we'd only use it in the right way. We'd only be the right people. When at heart, we are larger than that. We are larger than the presence of those things. We are larger than the absence of those things. I'm asking today, can you hold a heaven-sized dream? Can you hold it? Can you have a destiny conversation with God?
Can you hold a God wants to do something in the earth kind of conversation? Can you hold it? Are you larger? Are you large enough within for a God conversation? Tim, please come. How do I know if I'm larger? There are things we feel. You feel it. But I'm asking, does it control you? The real test for me of whether I'm larger or not is what starts to control me. And so as I land this morning, as I bring this to a close, maybe you hear everything I've said and you say, man, it's hard. I can't do this. Um, I can't do this. It's hard. Like, man... I'm still on that offense thing. Um, I get I should be larger, but (laughs) this offense is large right now. Or maybe you're just opposition, distraction, whatever it is for you this morning as I'm just trying to paint this picture of a large heart. Maybe you just really feel that weight of its heart and you feel like I can't. Maybe you need to hear me well this morning and I want you to hear me really well. My invitation today... It's not just for you to walk out of those doors and say, you know what, I'm going forgiving everybody that hurts me. I'm going just being bigger than every distraction. You know, there are distractions that are so, uh, it's to be a distraction, but it's such an attraction that you're not even sure which one is the attraction or the distraction they came. Do you understand know what I'm trying to say? You are basically, li- do, you, do you get what I'm trying to say? Like, it's not as plain straightforward as it would seem. Or maybe it's opposition this morning that is hitting hard. You say, if you know where they're opposing me from, it's from my village. In my village, (laughs) my my invitation for you today is first that as we pursue largeness, my invitation is first that we would see how large our God is. Let's start from there together. How large our God is. In Psalm 35 verse 5 to 6, the psalmist paints this beautiful picture of God. I love it in the message Bible. It says God's love is meteoric. His loyalty, astronomic. His purpose, titanic. His verdicts, oceanic. Yet in his largeness, nothing gets lost. Not a man, not a mouse. Slips through the cracks. Amazing how God creates this large universe and he's so particular about every detail. What we see in our God is a picture of true largeness. How he sees every detail, every heartbeat, every every one of the legs of a mosquito and he still sustains the universe and the galaxies and our God just so large and vast and when I think about the largeness of God, I'm thinking about all the different types of children God has, like what a father, God has all kinds of, maybe you were coming to church this morning and you saw some people and you're like, ah, these also are Christians oh God, you know, like God has all, ki- all kinds of children, like all kinds of, we as Christians are uncomfortable with having all kinds of brothers and sisters, right? Hands up, yes we are, we are not comfortable with all our brothers and sisters but God is such a large father that man he's so large that he can have all kinds of of children and love us all the same and God is large when I think about God and just how large he is I'm thinking about Jesus walking on the earth and what we saw in Jesus in flesh and blood was a picture of the largeness of our God what we saw in Jesus was a picture of the largeness of our God all right and when we saw Jesus walking upon the earth he was so simple just like us but he was so large we could see God we beheld the glory of the one and only begotten of God we could see a sense of this is more than the ordinary like he was so large we could see the weight of offense that was against him but even in the weight of offense right on to the cross we saw Jesus loving and forgiving and just loving his enemies and laying down his life for the people that hated him in fact at some point some of Jesus disciples in Luke 9 came to him and they said they said Jesus like how can these people reject us they said Jesus let us command fire to come down from heaven and burn all of them and Jesus like calm down you don't know what kind of spirit you are of like Jesus was this guy that was just so large that even in the place of offense he was loving and forgiving and just you know laying down his life for the people and what we saw in Jesus is that he was large enough for all kinds of people to find to find a safety. And so when you came around Jesus, you would see a prostitute there crying. You would see a tax collector. You would see you would see people that everybody says they shouldn't be around. In fact, literally, they called him a friend of sinners. Like this guy was so large that that these kind of people could find not just a safety, but but they could find change. They could find an empowerment to become what God calls them to be, right? So so they were around Jesus and there was just that sense of Jesus had an atmosphere that could draw people. Jesus was so large that unlikely people could be around him. But it wasn't even just the poor and the unlikely because you're about to say, oh yeah, he was just like an activist and so he was fighting for the rights of the poor. But but you also saw with Jesus that he was large enough that the teachers and and the Nicodemus was coming to him. And so it was the rich, it was the strong and mighty, it was also the poor and he gave everybody that sense of identity and of his attention and of love and Jesus was large 
Look at the distractions that lined up against him. The Pharisees would always have a question. The Sadducees would always be challenging something. And, and Jesus is about serving these people and loving these people. And there's a question there. There's a challenge there. Jesus wants to heal somebody and they're trying to test him and blah, blah, blah. But we saw a Jesus who, who would stay true to his sense of calling and, and his sense of assignment and his sense of destiny. And his eyes were set on his mission. You would hear Jesus say words like, for this cause I was born. And even as he was doing that, he was still giving the Pharisees uh, valid answers to their questions and, and given and Jesus was I feel like Jesus would go to bed every night and, and what we could see was just a largeness a largeness and Jesus was large enough to see through the temporary because in Hebrews chapter 12, 2 and 12 when the Bible is saying you know don't the race that is set before you run with endurance in verse 2 it says looking on to Jesus who for the joy that was set before him look at that looking on to Jesus who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross man the cross was painful but it was temporary he endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the throne at the right hand of the throne of God we see a savior who in the midst of temporary pain stayed true to a permanent assignment who in the midst of the shame and of the cross and of what was pressurizing and what was pressing he stayed true to that sense of destiny and of assignment. He was large enough to see through the temporary. I'm grateful that he was large enough to hold a heaven-sized dream. He was large enough to do what it took for my redemption. He was large enough to be in a conversation of destiny with God and to say, man, let us save humanity. I'm grateful that he was large enough to not just get swamped in what was going on around, but Jesus was large enough to hold a heaven-sized dream. And so, and so here's, what, here's what I want you to think about. As we think about the largeness of Jesus, and you ask him, what does that have to do with me? Here's what it has to do with you. Because in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, we see these words, and maybe you've heard it before, where the Bible says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And then it says, if anybody hears my voice, I would come into him. And I grew up here in that verse a lot. It was every evangelism meeting. It was every altar call. He stands at the door and he knocks. But still, I realized this was written to a church. This was not written to unbelievers. This was written to Christians. That Jesus is standing at the door and he's saying, I'm knocking. And he's saying this to Christians. It's not to unbelievers. There's the unbeliever part. But Jesus is literally saying to people that have put their faith in him that I'm standing at the door to knock. And you know why? Because as long as there's a disparity between the largeness that is in Jesus, that when I look at Jesus and I see largeness in him, but I look at my life and I don't see all of it, Jesus is saying, there's still some knocking I'm doing at your heart. I still need some more access. I still need some more occupancy. I still need some more room in your life so that I can make you to look like me. So I'm knocking on doors. I'm knocking on doors. I'm knocking on who you are. I'm knocking on what you've been I'm knocking on where you've been and saying give me room give me room let me express my largeness in your heart I know of yourself you feel small and you feel like the world clutters you but Jesus is saying give me room let me express my largeness let me help you forgive like you can't let me help you stay attracted like you can't let me make you a person of vision like you can never be in yourself and so Jesus says I stand at the door and I knock and this morning my invitation is that we would open up to him that our largeness is not just about all that we can pursue on the outside but our largeness this morning is about how much room does Jesus have in me here's the largeness check I'll give everybody this morning your largeness check this morning is there room enough for Jesus is there room enough for Jesus is there room enough for Jesus because as long as there's still more of him I can become as long as I can give him some more room this is the true picture of the largeness of my heart the largeness of my heart and of my life is not everything I can win on the outside it's first of all about saying Jesus Jesus within my heart have some more room have some more space you've been speaking to me about that thing I'm going to allow you Jesus you've been telling me to change that I'm going to change it I just want to give you room every time you knock to say I want to be the kind of person that you call me to be my largeness is how given am I to Jesus listen friends on the day that he was born the palace looked large on the outside but there was no room inside for Jesus. All the inns looked large on the outside, but there was no room within for Jesus. Oh, and the biggest houses in that day in Bethlehem looked large on the outside, but there was no room on the inside for Jesus. But there was a manger. There was a manger where they began to stretch and say, let's get some space for him. There was a manger where they started to say, oh man, if it's Jesus, let him have some room here. And it didn't matter how dirty it was. It didn't matter how messed up it was. It didn't matter who had been there. It didn't matter what had happened to that manger. But as long as that manger could get room for Jesus, that manger became the seat of heaven. That manger became a place where the glory of God dwelled. That manger became a place where God was pleased to express himself. 
as long as there was room for Jesus. And what I think I'm saying to you today is if there will be room in your heart for Jesus, you may wake up this morning saying, I'm not the kind of person that knows how to forgive and how to, as long as there's room in your heart for Jesus. I'm the kind of person that gets distracted every time I'm trying to pursue a vision, as long as there's room in your heart for Jesus. I know I'm the kind of person that, that I'm never staying true to one thing. Things get to my head as long as there's room in your heart for Jesus. As long as every time he's knocking, I'm just saying, Jesus, some more of you. As long as I can lift my hands in worship again and say, Jesus, you have the right to not just be my Savior, but to be my Lord. You have the right to not just be the one I met 12 years ago, but the one I meet in a new way every day. That you can tell me what to do. You can tell me where to go. You can tell me how to live my life. Jesus, you are my Lord. As long as there's room in my heart for Jesus, then I believe, friends, we can be the large people on the inside. We are large because we carry a large Savior. We are large in our hearts because we carry in our hearts the one who is large. And what I want you to see today is that as we see his largeness within us, we can dream again about that real kind of large life. Maybe the world has made you feel so small this morning. Maybe you feel there's nothing to look up to this morning. But what I'm saying is if we look within and we see Jesus and we allow him, he will teach us to lift up our eyes. We will see again a largeness that only he can bring into our lives. In Psalm 138 verse 3, the psalmist says, the moment I called out, you stepped in. You made my life large with strength. God doesn't want you to live petty. God doesn't want you to live small. God doesn't want you to live for just temporary things that in 10 years time, you'll be ashamed of the things you were chasing 10 years ago. God doesn't want you to be ashamed to tell your children what you are doing in your youth. God wants you to live for things that will matter. God wants you to live a life in the sound of destiny. He makes our lives large when, when he steps in. And so today, if God can work a largeness in our hearts, then I believe he already has a vision of largeness for our lives. In Isaiah chapter 54 verse 2, it says, Clear lots of ground for your tents. Make your tents large. Spread out. Think big, God says. There's a way we start to think. There's a way we start to act. There's a largeness we start to live in. It says, use plenty of rope. Drive the tent pegs deep. You're going to need lots of elbow room for your growing family. You're going to take over whole nations. You're going to resettle abandoned cities. So my invitation for us today is that in a whole new way we would welcome Jesus and his largeness into our hearts. And out of that, if he can do it in our hearts, he can do it in our lives. Out of a largeness of heart, we will truly live a large life. We will not live cheap and petty because something happened in the news, hey, you, are, you are crying because something uh, If we are large in our hearts, then we can truly live. We can be the people that God calls us to live. We can live in the wide open spaces of destiny. We can find fulfillment and joy. We can live the life we were made for. We can be running in the rhythms of the grace of God. If we are large in our hearts, then we can truly be large in our lives and so today if you're not standing can you stand with us i'm going to put a declaration on the screen i'm going to have us say it out at the top of our lungs today i don't know about you but i want something more than the petty life the world is trying to impose on me i don't want my monday to friday to just be reactive and what they said what they didn't say i want to live my life in the rhythms of the grace of god i want to live the kind of life that jesus died for me to live i want to be the kind of person that is bigger than the temporary things because i serve a god who once and for all has established a permanent truth about his love for me I want to be that kind of person. So somebody, would you say in Jesus' name, I will not live small and petty. Say, I will not live offended and distracted. Come on, say today, I receive the largeness of heart. And I receive God's largeness in my life. Say, Jesus has room in my life. He has liberty in me. I will live audacious and full of heavenly vision. I will dream God's science dreams. And I will see them fulfilled in Jesus' name. Who says amen to that? Come on, can we clap our hands? I give my soul. I live for you alone. Every step that I take.
say, Lord, have liberty in my heart. Say, God, have liberty in my heart. Jesus, have liberty in my heart. Have liberty. Make me the person you want me to be. Jesus, make my heart large like you are large, Jesus. Help me to be larger than the temporary things. Help me to be larger than offense and what they did. Help me to be larger than the voices that are surrounding me and against me. Help me to hear a sound of vision today. Help me to hear a sound of the calling. Help me to hear a sound of destiny today. God, I give you liberty in my heart. I give you liberty in my heart, God. Jesus, you are large, so I will be large. You are large, so I will live large, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. The temporary pressure, let it not ruin, ruin my life. Let it not ruin my life. Let me not make poor decisions, Jesus. Because of the temporary pain. Let me not make poor decisions, Jesus. Let me not sell out in destiny, Jesus. Let me not live cheap, Jesus. Let the temporary not steal away the things that you have done and established in my life. Jesus, Jesus. There's for more of you, more of you, more of you, more of you, more liberty, more within me. Speak to my heart again. Lead me the way that I should go. Touch my heart again, Jesus. First Kings chapter 4 verse 29 and God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore we're standing whether you're in this building or you're online anywhere just open out your hands to God sincerely before God say God give me largeness of heart just pray for a minute I don't know what that sounds like to you Maybe you know you're, you're living petty. If you be honest, you know, don't, don't give excuses. Don't justify. Say, God, give me largeness of heart. Largeness. It's like the sand on the seashore. It's larger. It's larger. There's plenty of fence, but it's larger. There's so much to come on, but it's larger. God, give me largeness of heart. Like only you can. God, work it in me. Largeness of heart. I don't want to live small. I don't want to live small, God. Give me largeness of heart. Let my heart truly be large to carry the weight of what you want to do in my life. Let my heart truly be large. That I'll be able to carry a sound of destiny, God. In my home, in my family, on my job, all that I do, God, let my heart truly be large. Lord, you give it to me. You gave it to Solomon. I ask for it today. Pray largeness of heart. Maybe you're about starting a new season of your life and you know you need a heart for it. You need a heart to be able to carry the realities of a new season. Whether it's in parenting, whether it's in a relationship, maybe you're about to get married, maybe you are, there's a new season. You know, I need a heart for this. I don't, it's not just about dancing on my wedding day. I need a heart to carry this. God, give me that kind of heart that is large enough for this new season. A heart that can love, a heart that can be true, a heart that can be faithful. Give me largeness of heart, God. Finally, this morning, I want us to pray Psalm 138, verse 3. Psalm 138, verse 3. The psalmist says of God, The moment I called out, you stepped in. You made my life large with strength. When I called out, you stepped in, God. You made my life large with strength. Now we've prayed it for our hearts. Now I want you to pray it for your life. I want you to pray this morning and say, God, make my life large with strength. Make my life large with strength. For everything you're working in my heart, God, make my life large with strength. I don't want to live small. I don't want to be one of those Christians that I have it right in my heart and, and that's all that matters. It matters that we live it out. It matters that we give expression to what God is doing in our heart. It matters that I will live large, that I will be all that God calls me to be, that I will pursue the extents of the grace of God, that I will see the full 
expressions of the anointing of God and of the gifting of God. God, I pray I will not live small. I pray God, make my life large with strength. Make my love large with strength. Jabez called out to God and he said, oh God, that you would enlarge my territory. That you would enlarge my coast. You would enlarge my territory. Somebody pray this morning that you would widen the space beneath my feet, God. That you would enlarge my territory, God. That you would bring me into the wide open spaces of destiny and of your calling in my life. God, enlarge my territory. God, enlarge my territory. Let my life be lived for bigger things, Lord. I don't just want to live for the temporary, passing away things. But let me live for bigger things. Somebody pray this morning. It matters that you pray. It matters that you start to put a word and a voice to what God is saying in your heart. It matters that you pray. I don't want to live small. I don't want to live petty. I don't know what's going to be on the news this week. But I want a life that is larger. I want a life that is larger. God, you stepped in. You made my life large with strength. You made my life large with strength. Somebody prayed over your family, prayed over your business, prayed over the work of your hands, prayed over your academics. Something larger than just complaining all every day. Something larger, something larger. The more that God sees for you. My life large with strength. Somebody just say, God, I welcome your largeness in my heart. God, I welcome your largeness. I welcome your largeness. If he can do it in our hearts, then he will do it in our lives. I welcome your largeness. Lord, have your way. Lord, I give you. Lord, I give you my heart. Give you my Every moment I'm away. While we, while we stay standing, I want us to give a moment for a friend who says, man, I need my heart to be set right with Jesus. You know, you can only start to talk about your heart being large when it's already right. And this is the first miracle God always wants to do in our hearts. I don't know who you are, how you came to church today, but we're standing because we honor you. We honor your decision, the decision you're about to make today. Jesus loves you. He knows your worst. And today he's inviting you to his best. I don't know who you are. I don't know what life is like for you. But if you would say yes to Jesus today, let me tell you what would happen. He would come right into your heart. He would forgive you of all your sin. He will make you right with God. Today will be a beginning of a new life for you. Because he paid for it 2,000 years ago. And all you're doing now is that you're crediting it to your, crediting it to your account. That you're saying, Jesus, I trust you as my Savior. So he would do what saviors do. He would come right in. He would bridge the distance. He would make you right with God. It doesn't matter if you've ever prayed this prayer, but you say to me today, man, you know what? I'm far away. Maybe you've never prayed this prayer, but you know right now as we stand and as we speak, you are not in the right place with God. Today's your day. I'd love to see you take that chance. I'm going to count to three and wherever you are in this room or online anywhere, as well bow our heads and close our eyes and just give a friend that moment. I'm going to count to three. And where you are, I want you to put your hand on your chest. Jesus sees you and he knows you. Are you ready? One, two, three. Put it on your chest. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for your sincerity. God bless you. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. God bless you. God bless you. I also believe there are people online. That's a miracle this morning. God is right there with you and he sees you. You know what, this is the family of the crowd. Everybody who put their hand on their chest, we're going to say a prayer together. Um, and we want to stand with you, we want to just support you and love with you as family. All right. But as you say these words, I want you to say it knowing that God hears your voice. All right. So can we all say together today, say Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I come to you today. I come to you today. Because you've made a way for me to come. Made a way for me. Say, I believe with all my heart all my that heart. Jesus, Christ Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Son. And he's the Savior of the world. Say, I believe he died, he was buried, and he was raised back to life. So that I can have a right standing with you. Say, I make today the day that I boldly declare Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. Say, I give everything to follow you. Say, please forgive me of all my wrong. And give me a new standing with you. I will live for you. 
who follow you for the rest of my life. And one day, I'll be with you in heaven. And everybody said, Amen. Amen, Amen. That's a miracle. Can we celebrate it this morning? And let's say congratulations to everybody who prayed that prayer this morning. That's a miracle that just happened in your life. And everybody who prayed that prayer, if you are in the building, you know what? This is a family. We want to serve. We want to support you. So there's this little gift I want to give you. It's a gift from our church. Once you get out of the doors, you're going to see some of our team wearing a fit support tag. And they're waving this around, just around the compound before you leave church. All you need to do is to tell one of them, I prayed that prayer. They would love to give it to you. They would love to register your decision so that we can be praying for you. And know every way that we can serve you, right? But please let us know about your decision. If you are online, there's a link wherever you're following service where you can let us know that you prayed that prayer and we'll get right in touch with you but one more time can we say congratulations to everybody who prayed that prayer 